We're turning today to Philadelphia, the sixth of the seven churches. Uh, as I said earlier, you may have all heard this, this will be the last one, uh, next week will be the last one of this series. Uh, Philadelphia, 200 years before Christ, and I like to try to time things according to Christ, because it gives me a better grasp of where we are in history. 200 years before Christ, uh, there was a king of Pergamos. Remember, we, we've talked about Pergamum? Well, their whole area was called Pergamum, and there was a king there, and he established the city of Philadelphia. Of course, Philadelphia means what? Brotherly love. He had a younger brother that was very loyal to him and very loving. So he named Philadelphia in honor of that brother. The time period of this is from 1798 to 1844. Now, 1798, that should bring a bell with your mind. That's when the pope is taken captive. That's when he lost all civic and government power. 1844. What's significant about 1844? Beginning of the investigative judgment. We are talking about very close to our own time. This is the shortest time period of any of the letters. But personally, I feel that it should be not... Uh, it should be 1798 to the second coming of Christ. Because... In the letter, what does it say? Behold, I am what? I'm coming quickly. And so I'd like to look at this church as extending from 1798 right on through to the second coming of Christ. This is the time of preparing. This church and the next church are time for preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. So let's get into the letter. And to the angel of church of Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, who is true, who has the keys of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Let's look at that first one. Holy. Isaiah had a vision of the Lord. And it's recorded in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You ever wondered what the train of his robe was? I looked it up this morning because it's always bothered me. What does white robe represent? Righteousness. And if you have a train, a robe that's training, it's a very large. His righteousness extends over all things. God is totally righteous, fully righteous, and the train of his righteousness filled the temple. Above it stood seraphs, and each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now you know when a word is repeated. It's repeated for emphasis. Isaiah repeats it not twice but three times, emphasizing God is totally holy in all things that he does. Again, Isaiah 57. For thus says the, the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. In the Bible, names represent character, tell a lot about character. God's name is holy. His character is holy. In all that he does, he is holy, eternally holy. He who is holy, he who is true. God keeps truth forever. That word truth 
can be translated real. God is real. God is genuine. And we need to think of that as opposed to unreal. Imitation. God is the eternal genuine one. But Satan is a temporary imposter. God made heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he keeps truth forever. That word truth is genuine. God is the eternal, real, genuine one. Isaiah, uh, Luke 16. If therefore you have not been faithful in unrighteous men, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Again, true is in contrast to unrighteousness. God is true. God is righteous. He is opposed by a contender to the throne who is not true. He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the keys of David, he opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. That may raise questions in your mind. What is that? This is a direct quote out of Isaiah. Isaiah 22. The keys of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder and he shall open and no one shut. He shall shut and no one opens. John is quoting right out of Isaiah. So we need to understand the history behind Isaiah's statement. Isaiah is talking about two leaders in Israel. He is contrasting two leaders in Israel. One is Shebna. He's the apostate leader. He thinks he's great. He thinks uh, he's the most important but God rejects him. Eliakim is a faithful leader. Now, let's go on. Isaiah talks about the transfer of power from one to the other, from the apostate to the genuine and the real. I will clothe him, that's Eliakim, the true one. I will clothe him with your robes. Whose robes? Shebna's robe, the apostate. I will clothe the true one with the robes of the apostate one and strengthen him with your belt. And then notice what Isaiah says next. And I will commit your responsibility into his hand, taking it away from the apostate and giving it to the real. I will commit your responsibility to in his hand. Do you see what is happening? Two leaders, an apostate and a true, but authority taken from one and given to the other. Now we have the next, oh, it continues. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. Now we could understand this. It goes right on. The keys of the house of David, I will lay on his, he'll can it, the true one, shoulder, so that he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Two contrasting leaders, but one is rejected and the other one is set up as the true and the real and the rightful one. Do you see how that fits to the dark ages? Last time we talked about somebody setting himself up, calling himself even God in the temple of God, claiming all authority and power, but John says, no, I will take his authority away from him, from the man of sin, and give it to Jesus Christ, the rightful ruler. Just before going back to heaven, Jesus said to his disciples, did I go too far? Yeah, I went too far ahead. Just before going to heaven, Jesus said, all authority, responsibility, power, 
All authority has been given to who? To the apostate? To the man of sin? No. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and tell, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has all authority. He is the genuine one. He is the real one. He has all authority, and he wants his followers to take a message to the world. When? We're talking about the last day church down in our own time. Going on. I know your works. This could also mean I know the abilities that you have, the skills that you have with which you can work. I know your abilities and your skills. This is important for this church, Philadelphia, because God is sending Philadelphia on a mission, a mission to take the gospel to the world at this time. And he knows the Philadelphia church. They have the abilities. They have the skills. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. An open door. What's an open door mean to you? Welcome. Come in, go out as you please. You are free to come in and with an open door. Jesus is giving to the Philadelphia church an open door and saying, it's time to go out. Time to go out with a mission. And it's significant. It's at this period of time. The open door is because what happened at 1798? The Pope was taken captive. The leader of the church was taken captive. He lost all of his civic powers, all of his governmental, his state power. He lost that. What happened to their persecuting power? They lost that persecuting power. It's also interesting at this time, knowledge was increasing. Travel was increasing. Missions were spreading all around the world. When? After 1798, in the period of the time of Philadelphia. You have little strength. You have a little strength. We're talking about Philadelphia, the church before with Sardis. Sardis was the dead church, wasn't it? Did dead people have any strength? No. They didn't have any strength. Come on in and sit down. There's chairs right up here. Come on in and sit down. Sardis didn't have any strength. But Philadelphia, does it have strength? It was the newest of the churches. And it began as the smallest of the churches. Uh, even though they are small, little strength, they are small, but the people at this time were Bible students. They searched the scriptures, and that gave them strength. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them who? The synagogue of Satan. Uh, the apostate churches. I will make the apostate churches come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, I want you to notice there are two groups in this, these verses, this verse. One group, the apostates, synagogue of Satan. And the others, the Philadelphians. Two groups of people here. Now, let's think about the time period we're talking about. In the 1800s, what happened in the Adventist church in the 1800s? 
Was there an Adventist church? There was not a Seventh-day Adventist church. But what did the, those diligently studying the scriptures, did they believe in the Advent? They believed in the Advent. They were Adventists. But were they accepted by everybody? Especially after 1844, were they accepted by everybody? Many Adventists ceased being Adventists. There was just a small group that was left, but they were diligent Bible students. They were diligent Bible students. Jesus says, eventually, everybody that's not of the diligent seekers after the truth, they will come and do what? Bow down. Were there many of those who rejected the Adventists, were there many of them bowing down in front of the Adventists and saying, you are good people? No. They rejected the Adventists. They rejected those who believed that Jesus was coming soon. But God said, it will change. They will come and worship before you. Now I want to deal with this word. And this word. That means future, doesn't it? After 1800, 1800, the believers were few in number. Now they will grow over the next couple hundred years, but they were few in number. But in the future, they would grow. And after they grow, what happens? The apostate will recognize, ah, God loves you. You are God's people. What does the Bible say? At the name of Jesus, what will happen? Every knee will bow. Not just the righteous, but quotes the wicked. Every knee will bow. Of things in heaven, of things in the earth, and the things under the earth. Everybody will bow to them. Indeed, I will make them come. We need to think about this word. Worship. What does that mean? Worship, that word, is used 25 times in just the book of Revelation. Do you think it's important? Yes. That's an important word in the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, over half of them are not worship of God. Who are they worship of? The Antichrist or Satan, right? They will come and worship. Fourteen times. Uh, worship is directed away from God, not towards God. Throughout the New Testament, worship is also important. Let's think about worship in the New Testament. When Jesus was born, who was the first one that came and worshipped? Baby Jesus. Shepherds. That's right. It was the shepherds. They came and worshipped. Who was the second group that came and worshipped? The wise men. The wise men came and they worshipped Jesus. In scripture, what group or well, where do we see the next worship scene? Herod. You remember the wise men went to Herod? And what did Herod say? Come and tell me where he is. I want to go and worship him too. Was that the truth? That was a lying report, wasn't it? He was going to kill, not to worship. Do you see the opposing worships? The shepherds and the wise men? Different worship than King Herod. We haven't talked about Revelation 4 and 5. After we finish Laodicea, the next one will be Revelation 4 and 5. It's the throne room. Revelation 4 is the first half of the throne room picture. Revelation 5 is the second half. But in the first half, it says, 
Whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne. Do you know who sat on the throne? In Revelation 4, it is the Father, not Jesus. Jesus is seen nowhere in Revelation chapter 4. Only the Father. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and power and thanks to him, the Father who sits on the throne, the 24 elders fall down and worship before him, saying, you are worship. But let's go on to Revelation 5. Revelation 5. I heard the voice of many angels saying, worthy is who? Jesus is introduced in Revelation chapter 5. And when he is worse introduced, they Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory. And every creature which is on the earth, I heard saying, Blessing, honor, and glory, and power be to him who, what? Who sits on the throne? The Father. Power and glory be to the Father who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Here we have the Father and the Lamb being worshipped. Now, this throne room scene is very much in contrast to the worship of God. I mean, to the worship of Satan. What do we have here? In chapter 13, they worshipped who? That doesn't sound like true worship, does it? They worshipped the dragon, Satan, and they worshipped the beast. Who's the beast? It's the apostate church. They worship the dragon, Satan. They worship the apostate church, the beast, speaking great blasphemies. That's not good. Against God, that's not good. The blasphemy's name is tabernacle and those who dwell in there. This is a contrasting worship to the worship of God. One more worship scene I'll look at. Revelation chapter 15. I saw those who had victory over the beast. Those, these are the ones here on Mount Zion in heaven. I saw those who have victory over, victory over who? The beast, the apostate. Victory over the apostasy. Standing on the sea of glass. And they sing, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. And then what does it say? All nations will come and worship before you. For your judgment. <laughs> have been manifest. This is just like what the letter to Philadelphia said. All, all will come and worship. The righteous will worship, but the wicked will also bow down before them. Let's go on. Verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. Persevere. What does persevere mean? Keep going. In easy times or difficult times? Keep going in difficult times. Difficult times, do it look like there's going to be success after the difficult times? Doesn't look like it. But it says, you have kept my command to persevere. And I will keep you from the hour of trial. The prospects don't look good, but they will go on. Ah, thank you. Before Jesus left the disciples, he talked to them. And he told them, you will be hated by all peoples. Let's notice. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who what? Endure. That in Greek is the identical word to this. Persevere, endure, going on through hard times. Going on through hard This is the church of Philadelphia. We're talking about the Philadelphia church. You are willing to go on to difficult times. 
the doctrine of the second coming of Christ, is rejected. But you have held on and you are going on, even though it looks like you're going to fail. Everybody else is different. Matthew 26. Jesus is going into the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice the feeling. Notice the pathos in the words of Jesus. Then he said to them, My soul is what? Exceedingly sorrowful. Exceedingly sorrowful. Even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He pleaded with the disciples, Please watch, watch. Watch with me. Stay here. Now that's a different word, but it's the same idea. Stay with Jesus. Persevere with Jesus. Even though there's difficult times, for the people after 1800, there will be difficult times. Stay with Jesus. Persevere. Because you have kept my commandments to persevere, I will also keep you. What does that keep mean? That keep means I will protect you. I will guard you. You will be in difficulties. I know you'll be in difficulties. But lo, I am with you always. I will be with you. I will take care of you. Notice Jesus' prayer to the Father. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. While I was with them, I kept them in your name. Those who you gave me, I have kept. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. The prayer of Jesus for us, for us, I will keep you, he says. I will keep you from what? We need to look at this. What is this? After 1800, what is going to be happening? We're talking about the last days, aren't we? I'm not talking about 31 AD Pentecost. I'm not talking about the time of persecution. I'm talking about the last days now. We know what is ahead of us as a church. It's called the time of trouble, isn't it? The little time of trouble. But in addition to the little time of trouble, there's a time of Jacob's trouble, a big, severe time of trouble. We know that what is ahead of us. Jesus promises to keep us from the hour of trial. Now, I want to stop right here, because here is where almost all of Christianity gets it wrong. You've heard of the secret rapture, haven't you? Mm. Oh, here's the secret rapture. I will keep you from the hour of trial. I will take you to heaven, and you don't have to go through that. There's going to be terrible times, but you don't have to. Is that what this says? I'm going to show you that is Wrong, taking words that are not there and putting in words that are not there. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Let's go on. There are two psalms that you need to be studying much in the time in which we live. Psalm 91. And what's the other one? Anybody know? 46. Yeah. Psalm 91 and Psalm 46. I want to read a little bit from Psalm 91. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. That's good news, isn't it? I will deliver him. I will be with him before he gets into trouble. It doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? I will be with him in his trouble. Is that what secret rapture says? No. 
That's not what secret rapture says. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and my honor him. Yes. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Notice what he taught them to pray. Do not lead us into what? Temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. That word is exactly this word. They are the same word in Greek. Temptation. Does the devil bring temptation to us? Oh, he certainly does, doesn't he? Do you ever hear that there is no God? Do you ever wonder, do you ever hear people wondering, why is so much war going on? Whether it's Ukraine or whether it's Israel or Hamas or whatever. Why doesn't, there is no God. Temptations that come to us. God, do not lead us into the temptation. I will keep you from the hour of temptation, from the hour of trial. <coughs> God, here's the other text, 46. Oh, no, this is 2 Corinthians. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. How? Will you be tempted? Yes. In our time, will you be tempted? He will not allow you to be tempted beyond who you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape. Taking you from the very presence of it, eventually God will take us out. And here's the other one, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. What? In those troubles. So we need to look at this. What does this word mean? It does not mean secret rapture. It does mean from. Now, in order to understand this, it's very, we need to look at prepositions. And prepositions are best understood with a circle. I went on the internet a few days ago to check this out. And they had it a cube. And they showed it exactly like I'm going to, but they added a few more. I'm not giving all of them. We understand what in is, don't we? That's clear. And above, we understand. And below, that's clear. Now, this one is a little more tricky. Two, when you go to something, it's not getting inside. That's just up to the, the edge of it. This is the one that goes from outside, inside. These are all separate words in Greek. And then you have uh, from. This is what secret rapture says. You'll never get into trouble. You'll be taken away before you ever get there. That's from. But there's another one, another preposition. It means out of, you will be delivered out from, from within. This is the one that is in our text that we're studying today. I will also keep you from, it's this one. Secret rapture says this one. That's not the Greek. This is the one. He will take you from within, out. In the last days, after the close of probation, trial is going to be all about it. And before the close of probation, but after is even worse. We will be right within them. But God promises he will take us out of those. From within, out. Now, let me get to another point. Most commentators look at this hour of trial and look at the book of Revelation and they see Revelation chapter 16, which is the seven last plagues. Without exception, every commentator believes that this hour of trial is the seven last plagues. And that is going to be severe. And that is right. But most commentators use the wrong definition. They use this one. Not this one. It's, 
It, that's not a definition. It's a different word. Most commentators use this word, but the Bible uses this word. Let's go on. The whole world. I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon who? The whole world. To test those who dwell on the earth. Will the wicked be tested? Will the righteous be tested? It'll come upon the whole world. But in Revelation, whenever it says those who dwell on the earth, it always is picture, picturing the wicked, not the righteous. The wicked. The whole world testing the wicked. Yes, it'll test the righteous. The righteous will be in trouble. But the righteous have protection, don't they? Do the wicked have protection? No. They live outside the protection of God. Will the suffering for the wicked be worse than the suffering for the righteous? Oh, you bet. You bet it will be. Behold, I come quickly. It's interesting to compare all seven letters and how they view the second coming of Christ. I'm not going to look at all the seven letters, but let's look at, for example, Smyrna. That was the suffering church where there was so much persecution and so much martyrdom at the hands of Rome. Did Jesus say he was coming to them quickly? No. He said, there's going to be another 300 years of persecution. But he says, hold on as you go through. We come to the church of Thyatira. Thyatira is the church that has Jezebel. And how long does Jezebel teach error within the church? 1260 years. Is that picturing Jesus coming very soon? No, it doesn't. But we come down to Sardis. Sardis was a dead church. Did the dead expect Jesus to come soon? No, no. They are the dead church. And what does Jesus say to them? Wake up, become alive. I'm going to come and you're going to be sleeping and you're going to be lost. Wake up, wake up. But now we come to our church, this letter, and what does he say? I'm coming soon. The coming of Jesus is not far distant like it is for the early churches. It's right now, here. We don't have much time. Time is very sure, sh short. Therefore, Hold fast what you have that nobody may take it from you. In the last days, we now need to hold fast to what we believe. But unfortunately, and I listened to another talk this week that explained this again, unfortunately, many in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are not holding fast what has been taught. They reject the sanctuary. They reject the idea of sanctification and perfection. They, they reject the idea of health reform and living a good, healthy life. Many Adventists are rejecting it. We need to hold fast the truth. I declare to you the gospel. Hold fast that word. That is the message of Paul. I lay hold of that which Christ has lay, also laid hold of me. Hold on. That counsel is abundant in Scripture. Hold on. And test all things. And hold fast. Do you remember the Ephesus church? There were even false teachers in the Ephesus church. And what did they do? They tested all the teachers in the church. And those that told the lies, they rejected. But they held fast to what was the truth. Test. Do we need to test 
the truths of the church today? Sure. Study them. And be sure you know, be sure that what you believe is true. Is that important to say to Protestants? Study what you believe and be sure what you believe is true. We need to test everything and hold fast to what is true. We have become partakers of Christ. If we hold what? The beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. You've heard the word remnant used very often. And you know what a remnant is, isn't it? That last little bit of a whole bolt of thought, the last little bit, and is that last little bit different than the first? No. The last is the same as the beginning. Hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who is prophet, he who is promised is faithful. God is faithful. We've got to be careful that we aren't wavering, 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 wavering. Hold on. Hold on faithfully. God is faithful. The church of Pergamos was commended for holding on to the faith. Even though Pergamos, that was the place, you remember the place that was called Satan's throne? I showed you the altar of Zeus. That was Satan, they called it Satan's throne. They lived where Satan's throne was, but they still held fast. Thyatira, again, they are told to hold on. There were a few there. Very few, but there were a few that were holding on. And to the dead church, the dead church, he says, wake up and remember that which was way back in the beginning. Repent and go back and remember. That's all the way through. It's hold on, hold on. To the Philadelphia church, Jesus says, I know your love. I know you are good. Hold on. Jesus says nothing bad about the, the Philadelphia church. Hold fast. A little while longer because the end is coming. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. That idea of pillars becomes significant when you study the town of Philadelphia. Philadelphia was one of the most beautiful cities in the area. But they were also subject to earthquakes. They were evidently on a fault. And there were earthquakes. And in 17 AD, when Jesus was 20 years old, there was a terrible earthquake that came to Philadelphia and leveled much of the city. But I want you to notice this. This is a picture of Philadelphia today. And what do you see? Pillars. Pillars, do they look like they're going down soon? No. And Jesus says, I will make you a pillar. You see, Philadelphia was one of the seven churches. And John had gone around to the seven churches. And there's no doubt John had seen these pillars. And he says, you are one of those pillars. Repeatedly, Paul was criticized and condemned, and he had to face opposition. And he told that the other disciples, Peter, James, and John, they faced opposition. Notice what he says about them. Cephas, James, and John seem to be what? Pillars. They seem to be like this. They are pillars. And then, in the letter to Timothy, Paul talks about the church members. And notice what he says about the church members. The house of God is what? The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. You are to be pillars. Every single one of you. Strong, that nothing will shake you. 
No war will shake you, no earthquake will shake you, no flood, no fire, nothing. None of the troubles. You will hold first to the end. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Here we have three promises. You won't go out. If you are in a big building and an earthquake happens, what do you want to do? Get outside, right? Get out where there's open space. He says, he shall go no more out. No more. There'll be earthquakes, there'll be troubles. But God says, you won't go out. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. In the Bible, names are important. Indicating action and character. Names indicate action and character. Think about Jesus. When Joseph is told by an angel that Mary is going to have a child, notice what is said. Mary will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Name and action. Names indicate actions in the Bible. Daniel prayed. And notice what he says about names. O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, what had God done? His action was delivering Israel, right? O oh Lord our God, you brought out your people. And what did that do? That made him a name. His actions gave him a name. Again, another prayer of Daniel. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen. And what? Act. Do something, God. Do not delay. Why? For your name's sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. God, you make yourself a name by delivering your people and by helping your people. Your city, your people, and your name. By the way, what was the city back then that Daniel was talking about? Jerusalem, right? Lord, restore us back to Jerusalem, and we want to build up Jerusalem. Are we considered about the, concerned about the old Jerusalem today? Much of Christianity is. They're concerned about building up Jerusalem and making the temple there, because that's where the Antichrist is going to come. That's not God is interested in. God is interested in Revelation 21 and 22, which is a new Jerusalem. A new Jerusalem. I will write on him my new name. Let's go to Revelation 14. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion. I spoke incorrectly earlier. I said it was on Mount Zion. They were on the Sea of Glass in the previous text. This one, they were on Mount Zion. I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name. Where is it? Meaning what? in their mind, in their thinking, and that is the basis of their actions. Notice what Ellen White says. The name of God, seen in their forehead, signifies yielding of the mind to intelligent and loyal what? Obedience to what? All of God's commandments. If we have God's name on our forehead, we are surrendered to God. We are obedient to God. We are loyal to God. And God puts his name on us. This is the last verse of this letter. And it ends the way all of them end. 
He who has an ear, let him what? Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Has God said anything to us today? What have you heard? Talk to me. What have you heard this morning? Did anything stick out in your mind? Persevere. Truth. Truth. Hold to truth. God is speaking to us, isn't he? I've seen you shaking your heads while I've been talking. God has spoken to us, hasn't he? We need to listen. This is the end of this letter. But let's go back and re review just a minute. What time is it? Oh. History of the church. This is the one I had on earlier. Ephesus, that was at the time of the apostles. They were victorious. But later on, Smyrna, they were persecuted. Why were they persecuted? Because they were victorious, because they were loyal. But Pergamos begin to see apostasy coming in. 538, that takes us down to the time of the papacy. Thyra, Tyra, full-blown apostasy. 538, not the 1798, because we have to interrupt it with the Reformation that comes in here. Sardis, the dead church, twice dead. As a result of all the apostasy, the church died. But the Reformation came, but what happened? They died again. Twice died. Twice died. Now we come to today. The mission of the church. To hold firmly to what God says. Seventh-day Adventist church is a unique church in the world. We have a message for the world that no other church has. No other church. We, and you know that most Christian churches, they divide up the world. One church here, another church here, another church here, another church. Is that what the Seventh-day Adventist church does? No. We take the whole world. We have a message, a unique responsibility to take the full gospel. Other churches have parts of the gospel. But do other churches talk much about sanctification? Do other churches talk about the Sabbath? We have a unique message to take to the world the last gospel message. And when that's finished, what happens? Jesus comes. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, Help us to realize that we aren't living back in the time of the apostles. We aren't living back in the time of Thyatira and the dead church even. We're living in the time of Philadelphia and from there on. Lord, help us to listen to your message and help us to live the kind of life that you want us to live and help us to take the message that you've given us and take it to everybody. Lord, next week is a serious message, a Laodicean message. And that's the people that God says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. We don't want to be that way. We want to be true and loyal and hold on to you and your truth at all times. Please help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.